Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about the four symphonies of Friedrich Gernsheim, which some of you have mentioned and suggested that I chat about. And oh, I'm so happy to do so because Gernsheim was the real deal, a serious symphonist of genuine ability. I mean, he really was. His dates were, let's see, uh, 1839 to 1916. And he wrote four symphonies um, and a bunch of concertos and some other, some other small things, uh, orchestral works, a symphonic poem and whatnot. There's not a lot of orchestral music. He was fundamentally a composer of chamber music, and he also wrote a series of choral works and other things. He didn't write operas. He was, he was kind of like Brahms you might say, except his first symphony was composed and released in 1875, a year before Brahms' own first symphony. So he's another one of those composers who was, who was, you might say, you know, milking the same cow. You know, his music is part of that style. But the difference between Gernsheim and a lot of other composers, German composers from the period, is that, is that his symphonies really are symphonic. What I mean is they sound really good. How's that for, a, for an objective factual analysis? I don't mean it that way. What I mean is he, he is a wonderful illustration of the difference between a composer who is conservative, like Brahms was, and one who is inhibited, like Max Brook, for example, was. His symphonies are definitely in the sort of Mendelssohn-Schumann Brahms category. There are four movements. They have the standard forms. None of them is terribly long. The first one actually is the longest. It's about 44 minutes, 45 minutes. It's a big work. All of the others are about half an hour. And, and they have no dead spots whatsoever. You may not come away humming all the tunes in them, for example, but there is no question that he knows what to do with his thematic material, how to develop it, how to give his movements contrapuntal life. Nothing drags. They're just really, really good, solid symphonies. I think perhaps one of the advantages he had was that he did not train himself in Leipzig. He wasn't part of that... Mendelssohn, Reinecke, you know, that, 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 that Leipzig group, all of which came out with sort of cookie cutter pieces that kind of sounded the same. He had his own personality, his own individuality. It may have helped also that he was Jewish. It didn't help him for his career because naturally, as soon as the Nazis came to power, his music was banned and it never recovered from that. Um, I don't think actually he would have gone completely out of style had had he been some other religion, had his music not been ruthlessly suppressed um, from the time of the 1930s onwards. Because like I said, you play these symphonies and you go, oh, wow, that's really good. It's terrific. Let me just tell you a little bit about them. Two are in the major key, two are in the minor. And here are recordings. Um, they've been recorded twice. There is a complete cycle on Artinova which is really hard to find now. It sort of disappeared. Um, it was a two-disc set. It was, it was very good. But this is just as good. Um, it's with the Philharmonisches Staatsorchester Mainz um, under Hermann Boimer, um, who's a very fine conductor. And the performances are absolutely lovely. This is on CPO. And you can get Symphonies 2 and 4, which are the two major ones, and Symphonies 1 and 3, which are the two minor ones minor key, that is, not minor in terms of their significance. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about him is that each symphony really does have its own individual character. Now, the first, as I said, is the longest, and it's in G minor, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's in G minor, and it's a very bold piece for 1875 for a German symphony of that period. Really, really just well worked out and enjoyable to listen to and beautifully orchestrated, you know. Um, Gernsheim was one of those guys who understood what to do with the wind section. He understood that wonderful axiom that great orchestration always depends on how you handle woodwinds, because those are the instruments that, that characterize the whole orchestra. And he knew what he was doing with his woodwinds. Boy, did he ever. Just beautiful combinations and constant changes of colors and shading of the melodic line. It's absolutely lovely. Really, really lovely. But beyond that, 
the first symphony, like I said, that's the biggest. Now, with number two, um, you, you, you find these subtle characterizations. They all have a little different instrumentation. Number two has a second movement, which is a tarantella, kind of like the finale of Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony, only it's wilder. And he, he includes parts for triangle and tambourine, which for some reason, I'm very annoyed at Mr. Boimer here. I mean, he plays as though he's embarrassed of them. You know, they should be quite vivid. There's a triangle part in other movements, too. It's quite vivid and beautifully written um, and adds a little touch of color here and there. And you, you barely hear it. It really needs to be bolder. I don't know why he, Boimer did it that way, but yeah, you could tell it's there. But the, this is a fabulous movement. This Tarantella is just wonderful. And it it really just gives the whole symphony its special character. Now, the third symphony was quasi-programmatic. It was based on the biblical story of Miriam. Remember Miriam's Zegas Gazong, you know, her song of victory and all that stuff. And So it, it's in C minor and it has, I mean, you don't need to know anything about Miriam in order to get the point. What really matters about the third symphony is that it has a very, very extensive part for the harp in all of its movements. I mean, it's just beautifully written. Again, you know, you just, it's just colors the whole symphony. It's, it's just voluptuous and beautifully done. It's sensitively done. And, you know, there's nothing like it in the other four symphonies. The fourth symphony has the largest orchestra that Gernsheim ever used. It includes an English horn and a bass clarinet and, you know, stuff like that. All beautifully integrated into the overall color scheme of the symphony. And at the very end, you have quite an extensive cymbal part. Again, which could have been played with a little bit more pizzazz. But everybody else is playing with plenty of pizzazz. So I, again, it's a little bit, a little bit unaccountable. But you know, you can see the way that Gernsheim is trying to sort of, sort of make each symphony its own individual personality through his choice of instruments, through the sequence of movements. Um, and also thematically, the themes are, are very, very enjoyable. I mean, you, you just aren't going to go away humming them, at least not initially. Once you listen to these things, you know, for a few years and get them into your head, you may indeed, because they're, they're just lovely. They're absolutely lovely. So um, if you are looking, here's the bottom line. If you are looking for a really solid, decent second half of the 19th century, German symphonist in the tradition of Brahms, um, one of the better ones, then Friedrich Gernsheim is your guy. I am not kidding. You're going to really, really like these. You know, I, I, when I listen to German symphonies of this period, I prepare myself to be bored. I really do, because I find them to be so formulaic and cookie cutter and inhibited and full of you know, they define themselves almost negatively. You know, they don't do this, they don't use that, they don't do this, they have no... But Gernsheim isn't like that at all. Gernsheim really knew how to write symphonies in a, you know, basically conservative style. But nothing wrong with that. What matters is that you know what you're doing. And Gernsheim knew what he was doing. So give these symphonies a shot. Again, they're on CPO. And uh, I think you're going to love them. I really do. If you if you know that style and you like that style and you're sort of a Brahmsish person, Brahmsish Schumannish, you'll be very very glad that you did. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.